Hello, so welcome to the 12th episode of the Philip the Turn podcast where I interview Yotam Solomon. So Yotam Solomon is someone that I've met uh, about a year ago through LinkedIn. Uh, we had many things that we're planning to work together on. He's also in sustainability, also fighting uh, our, <laughs> our carbon problem, our greenhouse gas problem. Uh, but his background is in design. Uh, he's been in design for a couple of decades and he's been incredibly successful in the field. He's been a creative director in many massive companies. He worked for LG, Coca-Cola, worked on hundreds of really incredible design projects. And I think this interview, uh, frankly, one of my favorites, really shows you how you can build a big successful career from design, which obviously so many people want to be professional designers. So, so many people love art love art when they're growing up and they don't really find a way to um, make that into a career. What Yotam has, and he's done a hell of a job. I mean, like, if you check out his LinkedIn, Yotam Solomon, he's a very accomplished guy. And as you'll see in the interview, he's incredibly intelligent and really knows what he's talking about. And he gives some really brilliant lessons for anybody that is an aspiring designer. So I really uh, hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you in the next one. And by the way, all of these are also on YouTube. I don't know if you're watching this on YouTube or on Spotify, but yeah, you can find the podcast now on, on both platforms. So thank you. Hello, Yotan. Hello, Philippe. How are you? I'm very good. How's your day or week? It's very busy, but I'm happy to say that it's all nice, warm, and uh, um, weekends coming in Los Angeles. So I'm very excited about that. That's awesome. Uh, same for me, of course. We're on the same planet, so the weekends at the same time. Uh, to, <laughs> I'm in, the, as you know, I'm in Barcelona, and uh, after, you know, ever hear of Port Aventura? Did you no. ever hear of this? Uh, this it's like this, uh, the main uh, theme park in Spain. So I'm going there tomorrow. So I'm also very excited. And then uh, the weekend after this, we have uh, the Easter weekend, so we're, it's going to be a four day uh, holiday. So a lot of rest coming up soon, huh? Very exciting. Happy to hear. Yeah, awesome stuff. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming on to the pods. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope the audience will as well. How about you start off and tell us about yourself, who you are, what do you do, and uh, why did you decide to come and uh, speak with us all here today? Thanks for asking. So, my name is Yotam Solomon, and I'm originally from Israel. I live in the U.S. now. And I am in origin a fashion designer. But what I get to do now is um, help innovate on new materials, um, understand the balance between um, virtual fashion and physical fashion, help companies push the envelope on the sustainability metrics, the overall KPIs when it comes to innovation and rethinking the supply chain that ultimately leads into wearables and how products can, in many cases, really be living out that goes far beyond how we express ourselves um, and how people perceive us to something that's a lot more powerful in a technology realm. Um, I'm very excited to be here today because I very much believe in all the work that you do and happy to share a little bit about how Fashion can be sustainable beyond the conventional way of people thinking about con uh, sustainability, mm -hmm. environmentalism. So that's why I joined today. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. So a lot to unpack, uh, of course. Uh, I think before we jump into sustainable fashion, I really want to learn more about you and your story. Uh, I find it very fascinating. Of like, Why is it that somebody is pulled towards something and i feel like you've been very pulled towards design if you look at your cv on linkedin like your whole career has been design 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 you've you reached really very high positions in many different companies doing design uh, which is obviously hard uh, everyone can be in those positions so what what is it about design that really pulled you into a, a to begin with and how did that kind of journey develop over time of course thanks for that it uh, takes a village and uh, you really de depend on really wonderful teams to develop everything from the ground up. But when it comes to design, to me, design is actually the basis um, to most of the technologies versus the technologies being the basis. So when I start my journey, I actually visualize the entire process from 
the raw materials and how they're harvested all the way down to the finished product. And through design, you really get to rethink all of these elements. So most people, when they think about design, they think about the the final deliverable after all of the R&D and the farming and the development, when it, whether it's the material, the product, the processing, um, and even down to how um, the marketing happens. But product and design are so intertwined, and design really starts at the very beginning. And we're seeing a really great shift right now, which is something that I was hoping to see based on everything I've been doing for years now, is designers looking for inspiration beyond um, the conventional social, um, political, and um, artistic realm, and really rethinking how the materials themselves, the basis of the technology, how do we rethink something as simple as environmentalism and how do people connect to that, the consumer? And um, I'm very passionate about design because design is not just how people perceive something because in my world, I get to tell a very unique story about the basis of each technology I get to work on through the design of the product. And I think that mm-hmm. that's a space that I'm very passionate about. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, it seems that I'm really focused on designing my career and I'm very happy that that's the case. It's amazing. And so tell me when you're actually, what age were you when, when you decided it's design? Surprisingly enough, uh, 17, I was mm-hmm. a classically trained violinist before. And in high school, I had the epiphany that uh, where I should really focus my attention is design and develop that part of my personality and um, career really focused on as my profession because I, I realized that Though I, I very much enjoy to this day being inspired by music, um, my strength really lies in visual compared to uh, sound. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a, a very unique journey, but interestingly enough, I, I still very much uh, get inspired by music, even though it's an incredibly non visual tool. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of design to it now, like music, you know, like you can. You could design using a, not just, you know, eyes, I guess you could design using ears, like there's patterns, there's rhythm, you know, I think all of that is designed to some extent, don't you think? Mm-hmm. And these days, I actually do think that there is a very interesting link between the mathematical and the scientific side of music to how we're moving into this virtual reality with the metaverse. Mm-hmm. And Interesting enough, most people don't realize this, but in fashion, we actually have quite a bit of math too. So whether it's the pattern making, whether it's the calculations for the amounts used, whether it's developer lifecycle analysis for products and looking at the entire supply chain and calculating all these numbers, there's quite a bit of math in in Uh fashion itself. So it's not just uh, visuals. Now, do you see yourself as a little bit of a mathematician? Do you think like being a mathematician in design is like an edge? It's very important. Um, And whether you see numbers visually or whether you see numbers on a strictly mathematical um, level, it's going to be a very helpful objective in life, period. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do think that artists that have a unique sensibility with math are able to see things slightly differently than ones that don't. But again, everybody's have a very unique perspective and Mm -hmm. every artist gets inspiration from a unique space that they've been developing their whole life. So Mm -hmm. um, they could have a completely different edge that has nothing to do with math. So it's it's a very Mm -hmm. interesting question. Very cool. So let me ask you another, another very interesting question. There's so many people in this on this planet that like would love your career that are like really into art, that are really like design focused. I love drawing. Some of them are brilliant at it as well. But I think there's a there's <laughs> I think we have a big problem in the world in general of of 
teaching young young people how to align their passions with careers. I think there's so that, that there's a massive problem with this that most people don't, don't even they think that it exists. You know, like there's if you ask one thousand designers in secondary school, like and you know by design I mean like they're they're painters, drawers, you know anything um, anything to do with expression visually. If you go ask a thousand of them. What is your plan of turning this into a career so that you can love your job? I would say the vast majority of them would not have a clear cut plan of how to pursue that. How have you succeeded, right? Where, where the truth is major, majority definitely don't. How have you succeeded in making design your career and what steps did you follow uh, on that path? That's a very loaded question right there. <laughs> I know, right? I'm very fortunate I get to speak in different colleges and universities and I wish I could create a masterclass where I help people understand different ways of thinking about the same objective and really help people understand the magnitude of objective thinking that is out there because it's so personal to each individual and you always have a customer, whether it's the end customer, whether it's your boss, whether it's your CEO, whether it's a board of trustees. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody that you have to um, cajole. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that where I aim to help others also think about perspective is not only the way that other people perceive their own work, but mm -hmm. identifying the gaps, not only in the marketplace, but in the industry at, at a whole, and looking into those gaps and seeing where they have the skill set to shine, and really honing in and really perfecting that, that art in their own way. I have also mm -hmm. seen people try and do that, but because they're not listening to their own instincts and really trust that their work will shine because of the way they think and because they how they want to develop it, they unfortunately softening and demuring themselves, like dimming mm -hmm. their own um, individuality mm -hmm. exactly to account for something that's expected. But by doing that, they're actually working against the potential. So mm -hmm. it's those elements of understanding how perception with others work and how to, to work with that and, and nurture that. It's how to develop your own skill set mm -hmm. um, by remembering all of those different objectives and the perspectives. And it's also while doing all of this, really trusting your instincts based on education. And I have always been very specific about saying this, especially in college, as you're starting your career, you don't necessarily have the experience to understand quite how certain industries and certain functions within um, positions and companies work. And you do need that experience to understand that. So it doesn't just happen overnight. And we all have our own journeys. But the number one thing is, always think about uh, like a true marketer how do people perceive what i do do they truly understand it and if not how do i fix that and mm -hmm. beyond that aside from perfecting what i do as a person what can i do to really embody myself my personality my creativity and who i am as a person whether or not somebody else likes it because there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like what you do and that's okay Damn. You really need to start a masterclass. I really like this. Hopefully, this podcast will be like a mini masterclass because this is very good uh, information. There's so much to unpack in that. Uh, but one thing I want to ask, which is always in my mind, frankly, because obviously I work with other designers. I think that to be a professional designer, or let's say to succeed, a very valuable, let's say, skill is a soft skill is to have a, a thick skin. I think like compared to other professions and disciplines right i think design you are so much more connected emotionally to your work 
than a majority of other disciplines, right? Compared, for example, okay, maybe sales, I was going to use sales as an example. You do get rejected a lot in sales, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, so that you, it, it's maybe not the best example, but 99% of other professions, I don't think you get as attached to the work that you're doing. And so when you get criticism and the work doesn't necessarily have to be bad, but if someone just doesn't understand it, is not looking at it uh, the way you're looking at it, and maybe they are just the worst designer and just don't get that, that can also happen. That can definitely also happen where it's really not your fault, but you're still getting all the criticism and you're getting loads of pushback and you could have done something amazing, but then you get all this criticism and I think that you know better than me, but that must happen very often, like throughout your career. Like that must happen like at least once a year, probably more, right? So like you have to deal with that all the time. What 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 do you think? How do you how do people deal with this? Yeah. So there's there's a few things. Most importantly, everybody are entitled to their own thoughts and their own um, commentary, right? I always say, if somebody is um, been raised well, they'll know to stick to constructive criticism because if you can help somebody develop something better, it's just a hateful, you know, objective to say something that doesn't help the the process. Um, so that happens. Everybody's opinion is objectified. Now you have people that don't quite understand what you're trying to do, but may actually bring something very interesting to the perspective. So personally, I always ask people what they actually think and for the true honest feedback, whether it's good or bad, while saying, sticking to the, again, idea of constructive versus destructive. But um, as an individual, you have to decipher between the commentary that will help you perfect what you're trying to do and is subjective and appropriate to what you're actually trying to create compared to the commentary that is not helpful and that doesn't come from somebody who truly understands what you're trying to do. And mm -hmm. as an artist, you have to decipher between the two. And with time, you get more and more skilled in understanding who are the people you should be listening to compared to the people who may have feedback but is not it may not be as appropriate to what you are actually trying to achieve so mm -hmm. it, there's always those two sides of the coin and you have to have deep skin like you're saying but more so something that i create now is not something that i get attached to so even if something somebody criticizes something that's in the now in a few months i'm going to be in a completely different space with what i want to design and how I want to objectify my perspective with a specific season, a specific product line, a specific launch. So if you as an individual are getting so stuck in that space of this is the best work I've done, it just means you haven't been in the industry long enough to know that you're always developing no matter what. And even as you get older and even as you retire, you, your mind changes and you're continuously educating yourself so mm -hmm. as artists we can get attached to attached to what we're doing because it's part of the evolution and when mm -hmm. i look at work that i've done 10 years ago of course there's some pieces i like but as a, as a perspective there's absolutely zero chance i will be recreating those collections the same way because i know better now and i evolved since then and i think mm -hmm. that's also really important to think about when you're dealing with criticism because Again, it's it's evolution, so it's mm -hmm. okay. It's not the end mm -hmm. of the world, and people to to take shouldn't take it too personally. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, a lot of really very useful information. Um, wow, <laughs> uh, and really really a lot to take in. So when when you are going through your design career, right, uh, going through through the various levels, do you have like do you still remember? Your, your favorite product that you've ever worked on. I'd love to learn a little more about your your process and like how you uh, connect with uh, different things that you work on. Throughout your career, do you have that one product? Uh, and if it's two, then, then we can we can talk about two. But what did, do you have something so close to your heart still from the past? No. Um, oh, I have so sorry. many favorites. <laughs> it would, we would be here for a few hours 
as I explain those. There are two, two fun stories I will leave with you based on your question. Uh, the first one is um, that I got to work with Dasani and unveil the first 30% plant-based bottle back in the day, which Dasani is owned by Coca-Cola. And what I enjoyed in that project wasn't so much the, the, the wonderful media attention and the fact that I Glee got to actually open the show and that I got to produce a show where I designed um, a, a full runway show with real living plants and flowers at the Grove in LA on Earth Day. What was really unique to me was the process and how it was the first time I ever had to park a, a refrigerated truck outside my downtown studio to be able to actually develop them while keeping certain elements of the vegetation cold. And that was one of the first times that I ever had to do something like that. And that's something I remember very, um, like a, it's very nice, vivid memory because it was just so out of my comfort zone to think that I had to create such a almost stale environment and it was so calculated and all the elements have to work just right to execute. Um, and the timing was so important. So I remember that as being a really fun challenge that I enjoyed. But I think that the biggest story is the hundreds of projects that never come, came to fruition where mm -hmm. I, as a person, may have been devastated at the time um, because you do work towards something and in some cases you do get paid and then the project gets cancelled in the last minute for various reasons and you don't get to show that. But those projects are almost as important. And there's a book called um, Unbuilt Structures or Unbuilt Cities. I forget the name of it, but it's showing you all the things that could have been. And I think that that's also, as an artist, a huge part of who you are because sometimes some of your most unique projects never see the day of light. And that's mm -hmm. also part of the journey. And that's something, in some cases, that's more emotionally connected to who you are because it's almost like a secret. And very few people get to know about that secret because sometimes it's always mm -hmm. NDAs and confidentiality agreements. And sometimes you get to work as a ghost designer. So I think that some of the more memorable journeys are the ones that actually never ended and mm -hmm. get stuck in this time capsule. Wow. Wow. That's, that's how many projects did you have canceled in your life? That got canceled and uh, or they had the plug pulled. Um, I would say close to 150. Holy crap. Wow. So well, much more than one a year. Yes. <laughs> more like maybe closer to even one a season. Uh, this is crazy. That's a lot. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And wow. it, people that are in the industry do realize that that is a very normal part of what you do. And it's it's okay. It's just another part of the job. But I think um, it, go on. Oh, sorry. One day, hopefully, I'll actually make a mini book with some of my favorite highlights of all the projects that <laughs> ne never, never really finished and never launched. That would be super cool. Uh, I would genuinely, I would buy and read that book because just, it sounds like very, very interesting. Like the amount of things that could have happened, like the the amount of like crazy designs, you know, that that would that was like hundreds of hours of investment to just be like come to nothing it's, and you're just one person just think about how many for how many people uh in your position this happens so and i think this is a lesson you know to anyone listening who's a designer or who aspires to be a designer it's like even someone of your stature right and i don't want to you know compliment you too much but the, the reality is that you've had a lot of success in this field for decades now right so even you have had this failure after failure because you could call this a failure right because you wanted the, the project to be finished right so you we call it what it is and yet here you are in this position so it seems that coming to terms with consistent failures and consistently not living up to what you want to get out of a project like the expectations you set for yourself is like a just what being a designer is do you agree with that yeah and i think a lot of artists will tell you that they really look deep into their own emotions and a lot of 
times they get inspired from the the sadness and the misery and the elements that are not they're not quite in 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 harmony with and i think that if anybody that's watching this would love to see the andy wall documentary they really do speak about this in one of the episodes about how some of the elements in his life that didn't quite work out were some of his biggest means of inspiration and the pieces and the collections that people most connect to so there is that connectivity to failure imbalance the the lack of um inner peace that is a huge force that brings a lot of very successful art fashion creative projects to the masses and become mm-hmm. very famous so there is you know if everybody was just happy and complacent we probably won't have most of the biggest masterpieces in the world today that's also very inspirational <laughs> and another really positive thing i think for someone uh, to hear uh now i want to switch the tone a little bit i want to talk a, a little bit about some specific in terms of design uh and that is sustainable design so I think you know more about sustainable design than me. So how about you introduce it and you and explain to us uh, what it is and has it been around for a long time? I'm very curious, has this always been the thing? Yes, so sustainable design and or environmentalism when it comes to design too, is the notion that you do everything in your power to identify the metrics and key the elements that can be adjusted, modified, so that everything you do is as ecological as possible. And there's different methodologies. There's um, carbon negativity. There's cradle to cradle. There's a high focus on ethics. There's a myriad of options out there for individuals and companies to focus on. It's almost impossible to address all of them as a company. But the idea is that you not only do good for the planet, you also do good for your community and your workforce. And ultimately, you're generating good karma. So it's almost as if sustainability now is literally another word for karma. Mm -hmm. And in my field, I've had a very big focus on this from the very start. And to me, um, I was personally against petrochemicals, plastics, anything that you can't upcycle or allowed to biodegrade in the right environment to me didn't make sense and to this day there's a lot of conversation around this um and now with carbon capture and carbon accounting there's a much bigger question around carbon negativity and how that's going to play a role in the fight against climate change but what's interesting is that when people think about carbon negativity it doesn't always lead into ethics It doesn't always mean that people are getting paid decent wages. It doesn't mean that it's sustainable in the way it's developed because if there's only machinery creating something and it doesn't have the community aspect that provides jobs and helps empower the individuals behind the company and the project, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually sustainable. So there's a lot to consider and a lot to unpack. And to me as a designer, I also want to showcase the actual inspiration, the the new materials, the new technologies, and even showcase the people that made it through the actual product. So when I design, Mm -hmm. I have to keep all of these things in mind, not only from the environmental point of view, so that the lifecycle analysis could actually um, address some of the issues with accounting for local manufacturing, reducing in freight, reducing in water consumption, electricity, utilization of natural materials, the removal of um, any pesticides, chem- harsh chemicals, uh, toxins out of the entire supply chain, and ultimately working with local people to develop to- tools and products that will be distributed locally versus shipped mm-hmm. overseas. So mm-hmm. there's so many considerations in this space. And to finish answering your question, sustainable design has always existed, except it wasn't labeled as sustainable because historically it's been the norm. And the reason why we need sustainable and environmental design now is because of the industrial revolution. 
So if mm-hmm. you look at the timeline, if you kind of cut off the Industrial Revolution to look at things before and after, prior to the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have um, mass production using um, oils and um, mm-hmm. petrochemicals and the creation of plastic. And because of that in- innovation, essentially, originally it made our lives much better and we lived longer mm-hmm. and we had, you know, it led to modern medicine. But we didn't realize at that point that it's actually getting a lot of harm and that that's not the way we should be developing our systems. So Mm -hmm. sustainable design always existed because it was done in small scale. It was done in a way that wasn't polluting the planet. And ever since we entered the Industrial Revolution, there was a huge paradigm shift where we started polluting in different ways. And now we're trying to reverse all of that back. So in a funny way, if we could go back to, you know, 1890, we would be producing things sustainably. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think that even though I say that, you know, let's say 1890 is a number, there still was destruction and pollution happening based on some um, things that weren't done right. Um, There's a wonderful show on BBC called Filthy Cities. And they actually talk about medieval London, um, the evolution time Paris and modern day New York, turn of the century. And it really showcases how over time living in cities, forget the plagues, they were able to associate certain industries with over time with pollution, with sickness, with people actually getting very ill and dying from polluters that happen in those environments. But it's really interesting to think about the quality of life we have now compared to 1700s, 1800s, with the notion that Yes, there was pollution back then, but there was also lack of hygiene. But there's such an interesting connection there between sustainable production, sustainable craftsmanship, and production of goods compared to where we are now. So it's really mm-hmm. interesting to think, and it's almost like you have to put this on a giant flow chart and look at how all of these mm-hmm. affect mm-hmm. us as people. Because um, when it comes to heritage, um, craftsmanship, and people making things through different generations, you know, families in Italy and Asia, um, the Middle East, um, Africa, South America, making things, uh, American Indians, uh, Native Americans, how they used to make things and how it's actually transpired through generations. I mean, 20, 30 generations sometimes of people making the same products using the same techniques. It tells you a very beautiful environmental and sustainable story. So Mm -hmm. very big picture. Wow. Uh, I mean, I love topics like this. I'm a a nerd, deep, deep nerd when it comes to generally economy, geopolitics, things like that. And uh, I I thought of a really funny thing when you you were talking uh, about basically why back in the before the Industrial Revolution, we were able to be, you know, sustainable and, and work locally and stuff. And I think this is just a crazy thought, but I, I think there could be something to it. Before you had like a steam engine, right? Actually moving garbage far away from your house was very inconvenient. You know, and if, if you think about that part in a second, where you're going to bring a crap load of garbage on the horses, like with, with a big saddle, you're going to go for travel for like 12 hours to a landfill far away and then put all the garbage. It's really not practical, you know what I mean? So I think like we had to have the technology, like let's say the efficiency of moving things, right? Which the industrial revolution brought to be able to get garbage and put it so far away that we'll forget about it. <laughs> it it's like this human nature. I, what, what do you think of this weird theory that I, I just thought of? Like, do you think there's something to it? Well, it also, you know, it depends on how you perceive trash because we still have here in LA some homes that have the historical incinerators. So before mm-hmm. trash companies existed, you would get a, a stone made incinerator that would actually be in your backyard and you would actually burn your waste. And mm-hmm. we still have some of those in existence in some of the historic properties here in LA, but also thinking about when they build the subways in New York, right? the debris, the dirt was considered trash, but that ended up becoming the west side extension of the city because they kept moving it and, you know, building more land. But to them at the time, that was trash. It's something they didn't want to have in the middle of the city. So trash is very interesting because we also have to think about synthetic, modern, 
plastic trash, something that doesn't biodegrade, compared to historic trash, which was biodegradable. It was mostly food. Even if it was building supplies, it was still very biodegradable, made with natural elements. So, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, too. Mm -hmm. um, but there was always the need for horses prior to vehicles to move things around, as we know, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, and another thing I want to say to to defend the industrial revolution, I've actually been doing a lot of research for this, uh, working with a client, is that you had child labor in USA, Europe. I mean, before the industrial revolution, if you're a kid, you're working. <laughs> you, you're not going to school, you know. So yeah. I think there's a lot of benefits of the industrial revolution. You know, it's not just. A, I think you agree as well. I mean, if you had the choice to do the industrial revolution or not. I would definitely do it, you know, uh, I think it's overall, it, it's worth it. And now we just have to, this is the way humans work, to be honest. Like we have to say, uh, what we do is we do trial and error, right? So we, we go industrial revolution, right? And we ignore the negative effects for as long until they really seep into our lives, right? Which is, we're all about our lives, right? And well, when it seeps into our lives, then we're like, okay, now we need another revolution, which is what's happening right now, the whole sustainability uh, revolution. So. Overall, I would I would think it's uh, understandable why why things happen like this. You know, from your from your description, I feel like I understand why why humans did what they did. And at the end of the day, we're not perfect, but also there's many many things we didn't really understand about what we're doing uh, with the, with the industrial revolution. We had no idea about greenhouse gases. Uh, this is like brand new brand new thing. We had no idea that at some point. Uh, the other thing is we had no idea that with the industrial revolution we could make our population explode from being like way under a billion, I'm pretty sure before the industrial revolution was actually under a billion to scaling. I think it's, we went up by something like six or 7 billion just in the, in the 20th century, right? So back then, I think before the industrial revolution, people never thought that we're gonna run out of places to put trash, you know? <laughs> I, I, it was like really the world is so big, you know, there's not that many people, people like even like massive cities are tiny when you look at them from out of space. So I think a lot of people would have thought for a long, long time, we have a lot of time left. But I think people underestimated how quickly, you know, exponentials work and how quickly we can as humanity go from the 1950s population and I, I forgot when it doubled, but it's between 1900 and 1950, we've doubled since then, which is insane. And everybody also has far more demands for stuff, right? Like we all want more and more stuff. So I feel like, um, yeah, I, I get completely what you mean, what you mean with, with, with the description of that it was sustainable at the start. And now it's, uh, it's no longer, um, now it's kind of coming back because it, it has to. And what do you see as the vision, right? for how this will develop going forward because it can't be the same as it was before the industrial revolution obviously right like this is we're, we're not going back to that we're past it right mm -hmm. so it's not possible so how do you what do you envision being the future how how will the sustainability revolution play out in your eyes well i i have a better question actually not not better than your question just a, a question for <laughs> humanity is um my three thoughts on how to make this happen is how do we really create protection for the environment, whether it's things like overfishing, hunting, um, polluting, so creating zones where we're helping nature recover, right? So ecosystem recovery. How do we create synergy between some of the leading and newest innovation companies to help them scale up and provide more state funding and federal funding and really help them by having the government introduce them to businesses that can help them scale and quickly. And a fun one is how do we finally connect the dots between some of our biggest problems in the world and the gaming industry? Because those guys are genius. Mm -hmm. Guys and girls, <laughs> I, I just, there's so much potential with everything we do <sighs> these one. days when it comes to connectivity and inspiring one another. And there's a lot of potential, and I think that there's, the tools are all there for us. We just got to start working together. And I also see this on the sustainability innovation front, where companies that are doing very similar work instead of 
crossing their arms and saying, let's work together, feel like they're competing against one another when we're all trying mm -hmm. to do the same good thing. And of course, there's still trade secrets and elements of technology that they need to keep to be able to really develop the businesses and get investment and, and move forward. But in the bigger picture, we're all trying to do the same thing. So I wish that to do that, there was more connectivity and more people inspiring one another one, and one another and actually saying, let's work together. Let's forget about the corporate side of things and how we're supposed to always follow the certain guidelines and you know, you're my competition and I need to be more successful than you. We really need to move away from that and, and work as a team. Uh, it's such an amazing insight. And what you said about the gaming industry is like, that is so deep and so amazing. You know, I've worked in gaming before. I had a, I had a metal game startup. Uh, it's dead now. It failed, but we had some really good projects. Uh, unfortunately, our, um, do you ever hear of a Facebook instant games? Do you ever hear of this? No, but it sounds great. So it's basically Facebook used to have like on Messenger, they, they made a gaming platform for Facebook Messenger uh, mm -hmm. and it became like games went massive on that. But because mm -hmm. a lot of developers were making porn games and things, really inappropriate games that were like listed on Messenger, they wow. ended up really just like bringing it down. So the game that we were working on uh, to release on that, we had like a couple of games planned for it. We couldn't release it because the whole platform basically shut down. Like they only allowed a tiny amount of developers, and uh, they would not tell you if they're gonna accept your game or not until um, you finish the game and send to them. So the risk became like insane. So we just had to uh, close our doors. But I really like your insight about uh, <laughs> your insight that you know game developers are geniuses, and not like to fucking compliment myself here or something. But that is spot on. Like when you look at how difficult it is to create a game that like gets um gets a massive amount of users like you're not solving a problem you're literally hacking a brain for people to give up on normal life and spend more time solving the puzzles you create i think like that's such a good insight you know like it's it's amazing and i agree like the, the, the problem of solving how to hook someone in on a game like create a world that they're into um, is a insanely difficult problem, you know, and uh, bringing that kind of brilliant logic to, you know, gamifying planet Earth, <laughs> gamifying sustainability. I mean, that's spot on. And I really feel that we're doing that in, in Tree Nation. That's actually uh, one of the main things. If you ever talk to my boss, the CEO, he always talks about gamifying Tree Nation and gamifying the idea of um, planting trees, you know, and connecting planting trees to any activity that we do and making it so, so you have a counter and you can always try and hit your goal. So I really resonate with that and I couldn't stop myself from laughing because that, that's such a good insight. I would never hear that from anybody else. So um, kudos for that one. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm sure you learned so much from that one company, right? Oh, Even though it didn't, it didn't <laughs> have wanted to, mm -hmm. that was a huge step in your career and your own evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, completely. I'm completely with you on this. Like, this is like failure is how, I mean, failure is how it, everything learns, everything, not just humans, everything. Like when you look at the universe, when you look at how many failed solar systems there are, there's a lot of them, right? When you look at human evolution, look like how many species have died out, how many species are extinct. That's another, another version of this. I feel like when you look at AI, I don't know how interested you are in artificial intelligence, but AI is literally just does this. Like AI doesn't have like a way to understand things. It's just like, oh, give me 1 million data sets <laughs> and tell me what's right and what's wrong. That's like just how it works. So I really think that this is the key and that the key is like your mindset, right? It's like, you need to get your mindset right then no matter what happens, you'll be fine. And I think this is the tricky part. And I think this is why you need to start a masterclass <laughs> to, to teach young designers uh, about this because it's a, you definitely have it. Um, and let's say, because we're running out of time now, but if you were to finish off and to tell young designers watching this, how can you develop this state of mind? Or if you think it's something else that's the most important, what would it be? What would you like to leave them with? I would love to leave anybody who's watching this with three recommendations. Always be a hustler because there's no other way of getting anything done. Connect with everybody in your community because when you live in a big city, there's an endless amount of events, functions, 
um, things that happen right around you that if you're not a part of, you're actually missing out by connecting with people, your peers, your community members, and really making sure you have the network to support what you're trying to do. And my last piece of advice is always perfect and continuously to perfect and educate yourself on not only your own art form, but what have others done before you to inspire you and empower you to do better and do something even more revolutionary and be more creative than they were ever ever able to be because they're the ones that help us set the, the tone and the stage for us to come and shine. Hustle, networking, gaining inspiration. The, the, the three lessons summarize what Yotam just said. Brilliant. I love this interview. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts so far. Thank you so much for coming on, Yotam. Hopefully you can do this again. I think it was super nice. Um, and uh, yeah, have a great day. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Ciao, ciao.